Guys, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you, go ahead, grab it, open up to 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings, or sorry, 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm already confused this morning. You've got to pray for me. Um, 2 Kings chapter 4. And we've got a lot of scripture we're going to read today, so I do want to encourage you to follow along. But while you're opening up, uh, I want to pray for you today. Uh, so if you would just bow your heads, unless you're flipping your Bible open, but let's come together in agreement and ask Jesus into this place. So Heavenly Father, we come before you today because we want to see more of Jesus. We want to know him more. We want, we want to um, understand him more. God, we just want him to be revealed to us more. So we pray as we look in scripture today, we would see and understand your love for us so much more. I pray right now, and I lift up right now any person in this room that might be struggling with discouragement, And I pray that in this next 30 minutes we have together, that you would grab a hold of us and speak to us and be with us today, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 8. It says this, One day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. So let's make a small room for him on the roof and put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. And then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day, when Elisha came, he went up to his room and laid down there. And he said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her. You have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the armies? In other words, she's saying, you know, I've got connections. I can talk to the king. I can talk to the commander of the army. You've done so much good for us. I want to do good for you. I've got the connections to make it happen. What do you want me to do for you? And it says she replied, I have a home among my own people. In other words, she's saying, you know, I'm good. I'm fine. My husband treats me right. I live among my own people. I don't really need anything. I'm trying to do something nice for you. I don't need anything at all. Then verse 14. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. But she she told you she doesn't need anything. But what I, I do know and she didn't tell you is that she's getting older and she doesn't have a son and she's always wanted a son and, and she's prayed for a son, but, but she doesn't have a son. So then we see verse 15. It says, then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O man of God. She's saying, no, don't do this. In other words, don't mess with me. You don't know how many times I've paced the floor in the middle of the night praying that God would give me a son. The times I've got up and just interceded and begged God, give me a son. The the times I've written on the the mirror with my lipstick to remember to pray that, God, I want a son so bad. And and I've prayed and wanted a son for so long. And then I just finally came to the conclusion it's never going to happen. I've given up on that dream. So don't mess with me. Why are you saying this? Don't mislead me. And then the Bible says, because of this great woman's faith that she conceived and had a child. No, that's not what it says at all. In fact, what we just saw demonstrated with her is that there is kind of a hopelessness here, an unbelief that, no, this can't happen for me. I've given up on that dream. Those types of things happen for other people, but I I don't believe it's going to happen for me. But then the Bible says in verse 17, in spite of her faith, it says, but But the woman became pregnant, and the next year about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. Then the child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers, and said, my head, my head. And and he said said to his father, and then his father told his servant what what any good father would tell his kids. He said, go see your mom. You know, I, I feel that way as a dad sometimes. My kids come in, oh, my head, or I skin my knee. I'm like, go, oh, talk to your mom. <laughs> you know? he, he says, go see your mom. And then the very next verse tells us, they carried him to his mother, and after the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon. So this is the, the brightest part of the day. The sun's at the highest point in the sky. She's about to have her very darkest, lowest point in her life. And it says, and then he died. 
and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. And she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the servants with the donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly in return. And the husband said, why? <laughs> Isn't that a common marriage? It's like they have yet to communicate on a very significant thing that has just happened in their life. The promise of God has just died. Their son has just died. She doesn't even tell him. She says, I just, I need a vehicle. I got to go. I got, I got to get out of here right now. I got to get on my way. He says, why go to him today? He said, it's not a new moon or a Sabbath. And she said, it's all right, she said. Which is better transliterated. She's saying, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. Have you ever been there? Someone asks you how you're doing, and, and you say, I'll be all right. But just to say right now, I'm going through hell, but I know I'm going to make it. I, I'm going to be all right. Isn't that refreshing when, when we could be honest? Wouldn't that be refreshing in our church if we could be honest with each other? When people ask us how we're doing, and, and we don't just put on the fake smile all the time. Because we come to church and we say things, man, how are you doing today? And, and people will answer like, well, God is good. He's awesome. God is great. Well, well I know God's good, but I ask, how are you today? The husband says, what's going on? She says, I'm going to be all right. I'm not all right right now, but I'm going to be all right. So it says in verse 24, so she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. She's saying, it's on like Donkey Kong. Or like Cy Robertson would say, it's on like Bing Bong, Jack. She's wanting to get this thing going. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And then when he saw her from a distance, the man of God said to the servant, God, look, there's the Shunammite. Run out to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Are your kids all right? Is your... What's going on? Is it, and she said, everything's all right. She answers this again. I'm going to be all right. And then verse 27, when she reached the man of God on the mount, she took a hold of his feet, and Gehazi came out and pushed her away. But, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She's in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. And then I love this Shunammite woman because the Shunammite woman, she finally gets before the man of God, and she doesn't just let him talk. She, she decides she's going to ask him the questions. She says, excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Elisha, sir. Uh, Mr. Elisha, sir, man of God. Um, did I ask you for a boy? Did, did I ask you to give me a son? Because when I remember back, if I look back when we were in my house and we were in my room and I gave you a room there, you know, the room where I put the bed and the lamp and the chair in there for you. We were there, and you asked me, is there anything you need? And I said, no, I'm good, I'm fine. And you said, well, how about this? You're going to have a boy. And I said, don't mess with me, because I don't want to get my hopes destroyed. I don't want to be hurt. I don't believe that that could happen for me. So you said, no, you're going to have a boy. And I had a boy, and then he died. Did I ask you for a boy? Like, this wasn't my idea. Why did you do this to me? Why did you bring me some great hope, some great promise, and then, and then just watch it get stripped away from me? Did I ask you for, was this my idea? Man, I've been there. I've got promises and hopes and dreams in my life where I start to think, wait a minute, um, I didn't ask for this to happen, and yet it seemed like I was being blessed, and now all of a sudden it feels like it's just being stripped away from me. Like, was this even my idea? And she's saying, she's standing before the man, was this my idea? I, I, I just don't get it. Why, why is this happening? Then verse 29, Elisha says to Gehazi, tuck your cloak in your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, don't greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the mother said, oh, no, 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 no. Your, your stick's not good enough. We're, we're, you're going to come with me on this one. And as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Verse 31. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. You know, you got to know at this moment, Elisha's sweating bullets because he, he's a man of God, but he's just a normal man like you and me. 
I mean, he felt God lead him to, to make a promise from God to this woman. And he makes the promise. And then this woman gets so discouraged and so hurt by this that he, he's, he's concerned. He's thinking, God, this woman's going to kill me. God, what, what's going on? What am, I, what am I supposed to do here? It says, Elisha reached the house. And there was the boy lying dead on the couch. And he went in and shut the door. And the two of them prayed to the Lord. So the first thing he does is he sends his servants to go lay a staff on the boy's face, and nothing happens there. And then the second thing is him and his servant come in, and they begin praying over it, and none of these things work. And then the third thing that he decides to do is a very strange thing. When you read this, it, like to me at least, it's like, it seems very strange. It says, then he got into the bed and laid upon this boy. Mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, and stretched himself all on him. And the boy's body grew warm, but that didn't work either. And then we see that Elisha turned and walked back and forth in the room. So, so he's, he's tried three things now. and he's, he's tried sending his staff, he's tried praying over, he's tried laying on this boy. And then now the fourth thing he does, I think many of us have found ourselves doing before, where he's walking back and forth in this room. He, he's just pacing. I wonder, have you ever been so distressed about something, so concerned about something that you find yourself just walking a, a, a path in the floor in the middle of the night going, oh God, I don't know if I'm going to make it. God, I, I think I'm going to lose my job. My marriage is falling apart. My kids are falling apart. Have you ever found yourself just pacing the floor in the middle of the night? Elisha's here going, God, I don't know what to do. I, I, I I, I delivered a promise that you told me to deliver. This came from you. And now it looks like the promise died. And I'm walking the floor here because I really, truly don't know what to do. So, so he, he tries these, these four things and, and they haven't worked. And then the Bible shows us that the fifth thing he tries is the exact same thing as the third thing he tries. Which is weird because just by trial and error, if something didn't work the first time, why would you go back to it? But but for some reason, God leads him to crawl into the bed once more. It says, then he got in the bed and stretched out upon him once more. And then the Bible would like us to know, it is noted for us to understand that the boy is resurrected, but not until he sneezes seven times. It says, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Why is that in the Bible? What are we talking about here? Seven times. Verse 36 Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. Now, you know, he was stressed out before, but they just resurrected this promise. God just brought this boy back to life. So now he's got a little kick in his step. He's like, oh, call that woman up in here. I got something to tell her now. She's going to be excited. Now, she was depressed earlier, and now she is going to be excited. Call that woman up in here. And he did. When she came in, he said, take your son. She came in fell at his feet and bowed to the ground, and she took her son and went out. No doubt she held on to the promise of God. The promise of God was resurrected in her life. I want to look at one more verse before we dive into this today. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. <clears throat> Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 says this. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them from afar off, we're sure to them, embracing them, can, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. earth. See, this verse is talking about great men and women of God, the, the fathers of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. This is talking about Joseph, Enoch, and Noah. These are talking about great men of God. And this verse says they all died in faith, not having received the promises. Like God promised them something. They start to see it fulfilled, and then... Then the Bible said these great men of God, some of them, they died before they even saw the promise of God fulfilled in their own life. This bit of time we have left together this morning, I, I want to talk to you. What do you do? What do you do when the promises of God in your life, at very best, are only partially fulfilled? What do you do when, when the dreams, the hopes you have in your life, at, at, at very best, seem like they've only halfway come to fruition. I think as, uh, as a kid, we can all look back and we can remember times when people have made us promises and they've, they've fallen through on the promise. 
And someone says, yeah, I'm going to be at your, your softball game or your little league game. I, I'll be there and I'll watch you. And then when it's your time to get up to bat, you look out in the stands and you don't see there's, that they're there. It's like you get that sinking feeling. Like you know what it's like when someone makes a promise and they don't come through with it. It hurts. Someone says, yeah, I'm going to be at your birthday party or something like that when you're a kid. We all know what that feels like. And then as an adult, we bring it with us and we remember when, when someone makes a commitment to us and, and that commitment goes unmet, a promise fails, it, it can hurt. It, it, it can be very confusing to us and, and, and really cause us deep pain. The Bible tells us in Proverbs thirteen twelve it says that hope deferred makes a heart sick. That if you've been promised something and you put your hope in that and you start, you start planning on something to happen and then it doesn't happen, it actually gives you a sick heart. If you're expecting something to come through and it doesn't come through. And, and what's even worse than that, because it, it, it could be even easier if you didn't receive a promise or you didn't have a hope in the first place, then if something doesn't happen, it's no big deal. But it can be worse sometimes when you start to see a promise fulfilled in your life and then it gets dashed. The Bible says here, what that does is that gives you a sick heart. Has someone ever made a promise to you that it was a big enough promise that you, you started changing your plans? You know, someone says, I'm going to be there. I want to marry you. You're going to get the promotion. This is, these are life-changing promises. You start moving things around, and then all of a sudden, it, it, it doesn't happen. That person's not even there anymore. I think what a lot of us do, since so many of us have dealt with that type of discouragement, that type of pain before, we start to reach out towards you know, self-preservation. And then when promises are made to us, and someone says, I want to do something for you. Now, you know, it's one thing for a man to make a promise to you. For another human being to say, you know, I want to do something great for you. I'm going to give you this promotion. And, and, and what a lot of us will do out of self-preservation is we don't want to get our hopes up. Because if I get my hopes up, I'm just going to get hurt by it. So we start getting really negative. And we hear promises that, you, you, you know, that your business is going to turn around or, or or something like that, and we start thinking, well, I don't, I don't want to count my eggs before they hatch. You know, I don't want to get let down. I don't want my hopes to be dashed again. So, so in self-preservation, we say, I, I, I don't know. I just, we just get negative about it. And that's just when men make promises to us. But what if the promise didn't come from a man but came from God? When we look at the Bible and say, you know, God's given us promises like John 10.10, 10, I came to give you life and life to the fullest. Or we look at a promise where God says, you know, if you train up your children now in the way they should go, when they're old, they won't depart from it. And we look at these things, and if I, were, if I were to be honest with you, there's times I've looked at my life, and I've seen the promises God has given us in Scripture, and, and, and I think that's a great thing, and I want to hold on to that promise, and I get excited about it. But then when I look at it in my own life, I go, it doesn't appear that, that really that promise is really being fulfilled in me right now. And it's like, God, you said that you would give me life and life to the fullest, but... Right now, it doesn't feel like it. I don't feel like I'm living a full life. I've talked to people who have said, you know what? God says that if we train up our children the way they go, that they won't depart from it. But I look at my kids, and they're wigging out right now. It, does, it doesn't look like this promise is being fulfilled in my life. I've talked to husbands that say, you know what? I'm, I'm trying right now in my marriage, and I'm trying to do things God's way. I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm changing things in my life, and yet it looks like my marriage is dying. It looks like things are falling apart from me. Where, where is God's promise in this? Have you ever felt that way? I remember it was about six or seven years ago. Uh, I got some of the most difficult news in my adult life, and I remember sitting across a man's desk as he was explaining something very difficult that I, my family was going to be going through. And as he began describing these things to me, I remember feeling like, like first of all, I got sick to my stomach, and, and I, I was feeling weak and shaky and scared. And I remember when I finally got out of the situation where I could go pray a little bit, I, I got away from my family and just got alone, and I started just being honest with God. And I had one of those moments where I went outside and I'm like, God, do you even see what's going on right now? Like, you told me a prosperous life. You told me a good life. And this is scary. Do you even care what's going on in my life right now? Because I mean, this doesn't look like a good thing. I know you're a good God, but this doesn't look good. See, when I was in that moment, you weren't there to tell me I couldn't talk to God that way. So I just did. God, I'm hurting. I, I'm discouraged right now. And I started asking the question, even, is this my idea? 
was this my idea that I had a prosperous life? No, I, I think this, this was in the Bible. You know, you, you came up with this. So, so what is going on right now? And I remember just being honest and raw. And the truth is, in any relationship, whether it's with another person or whether it's with God, communication is, is a key to intimacy. It's a cre- key to growing together. It's a key to moving forward. And one of the greatest examples we see of this in the Bible is a man uh, named David who would just speak to God so honestly in private. And you've got to pray private. Your prayer life has to be private. You can't just only pray over dinner time and only pray over your kids. If the only times you ever pray is publicly, you're never going to say the things to God that you really need to communicate with him about because you're always going to be trying to make it happy and light and God bless this food to our body and thank you for what's going on today. But we got to have the times where we're honest. And David showed us a glimpse into his personal prayer life in the book of Psalms as he would show us, he would just be raw and honest with God. And David would say things to God that if you're reading and paying attention, you'd be like, David, don't say that. If God hears you say that, I think you're going to get in trouble for that. And one of the things we like to joke about is some of the prayers David said that were just so human and honest and raw. There's a story in the Bible where David is talking about his enemies. He had people that were against him. And David started praying like this in the book of Psalms. where he's saying, like, God, I got an idea. Uh, I, my idea is this, all these people that don't like me, all, the, all my enemies, people that don't follow me on Instagram and stuff like that, could you just kill them all for me? That's a great idea, just kill them all, kill them dead, that'd be awesome, right? That's the type of raw that David, said. Like, you can't talk to God that way, but David did, did and it, he was just honest, and then he'd, he'd correct himself, and he'd, well, I said kill them all, but really how about you just do whatever your will is? And we see that this type of honest communication that David had with God led him to great places. Where in Psalms 22, he'd say, you know, God, why have you forsaken me? Do you even care about what's going on in my life? Do do you really treat me as your servant, as your son, as your child? Do you even care? And then that type of honesty leads to the very next chapter in Psalms 23. He's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me into green pastures. He, he blesses me. And, and we see that it's that type of honesty that we have with God where we begin to recognize how good God really is to us. And I think it's interesting as we, as we look in this verse that we just saw in Hebrews chapter 11, it's something that I think a lot of people skip over this verse and they, we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to really focus on it, but it's what I want to focus on today. And it says this, Hebrews eleven thirteen, These all died in faith not having received the promises. What do you do with that verse? You know, what do we do with the fact that that there are people who have served God and, and we're seeing God's promises fulfilled in their life, but then as the Bible said, they died before they even saw the promises fulfilled. There's a couple observations about these this verse. Number one, you should write this down. Two observations to take away from it. Number one, you're not alone. You're not alone. This is talking about great men and women of God. And if you're here today and you have a sick heart because you feel like there are dreams in your life that have died and there are promises in your life that feel like they have died, you are not alone. There are great men and women of God throughout Scripture that loved God and and, and worshipped God and honored God and obeyed God. And the Bible says that they, they, they started to see the promises fulfilled, but for many of them they died before the promise was completely fulfilled. You say, why is that? I think first off, we have to recognize that we need to change our perspective. That God gives us a way that he wants us to look at him, and and he wants us to look at him as a generational God. God is a generational God, and he describes himself as not just being God, uh, God the father of Abraham, but he says, I am God over Abraham, over his son Isaac, over his son Jacob. I'm not just God to Abraham. I'm not just God to Isaac. I'm not just God to Jacob. I'm a God generationally. I'm a God to all people moving down. He said, I love Abraham, and I want to fulfill the promises in Abraham's life. But many times what we see in in God is that since he's a generational God, is the promises he makes to Abraham, not only does he begin to fulfill them in Abraham's life, but sometimes he fulfills them completely in Isaac's life. And And the promises he made to Isaac, sometimes not just... Uh, to him, but he fulfills them in Jacob's life. And there are promises that God has made to you that, yes, he wants to fulfill them in your life, but 
He's a generational God where he wants to fulfill those promises in your kid's life, in your grandkid's life. And God is fulfilling promises that he's made to your grandparents and your parents even in your life today. God, God loves you. He wants to break generational curses off of you that, that don't just affect you now, but affect your kids and your kids and your grandkids and so on and so on and so on. See, when we look at this, we recognize that we, we serve a generational God. Sometimes the picture is just a little bit bigger than today alone. The second observation I get from this is that we are not God. We look at Hebrews eleven thirteen. We are not God. What do I mean by that? Because that seems a little bit harsh. Well, what I mean by that is we're not the source of the promise. We didn't come up with this on our own. You know, the idea to have a good life, to have a prosperous life, to have a great marriage, to, to be blessed, those eyes, we, we didn't come up with those ideas on our own. To be healthy, that, that didn't, see, these were things that God told his people generations and generations ago, and the promises he gave us here were here long before you and I were on the scene. So we didn't come up with this. We're not the source of the promise. We're not the initiator of the promise. Let me tell you what I mean by this. Let's just say someone were to make a promise to me. Hey, Jeremy's sitting here on the front row. Let's say at lunch today, Jeremy and I are going to go out. We're going to have a conversation that goes along the lines of, Dan, um, you know, we've been thinking about it, and we want to bless you. I want to give you a house, okay? I want to give you a boat, and I want to give you a car. If he tells me these things, I'm going to be, Jeremy, you don't got to do that for me. You don't got to give me all these presents. No, we've been thinking about it. I really want to do this. I want to get you a house. I want to get you a boat, and I want to get you a car. And he held his hand out there because he wants to shake on it. I ain't shaking his hand. I'm hugging him, man, for that. That's a huggable promise, right? I love that promise. And then what, what if a year goes by, and, and I haven't heard anything yet? I might shoot him a text and be like, hey, it's uh, been a year. I'm excited about this new house. It's going to be awesome. Right, a promise like that, that'd be something I'd change my plans over. I mean, we'd, we'd change our life over that. Only when I would sit down, we'd be budgeting, talking about the next year. So, oh, we don't have to save money for a house anymore. Jeremy's got that covered. Um, and in fact, we could, we could sell my truck. He's going to buy us a new car. And, and that boat we've always wanted, it's coming. We don't even have to worry about those things. We change our plans over it. And then year two comes around, I haven't heard anything. Like, uh, hey, this time, I'm not just shooting him a text. I'm writing him a whole email. Like, hey, man, um, I've been, I've been thinking about this house. I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to the car. I'm looking forward to the boat. And so like, this is really, really cool, right? Like, I'm pumped about this. What if year three comes by? I'm calling him up on the phone and say, hey, Jeremy, what's going on, man? You promised me some stuff. And what if? I said, hey, I, I know I said that, but um, I, I'm not going to be able to come through. I talked to my wife. It's just not going to happen. I mean, when I hang up that phone, I'm hurt, right? That, that doesn't feel good, but let me ask you something. In this equation, where does the responsibility lie? <laughs> Not me. It's Jeremy's fault, right? This wasn't my idea. I didn't come up with the idea that I want the house and the boat and all this. I, that wasn't my idea. Th this was Jeremy's idea. Hold on a second, child of God. Hold on a second, son of God, woman of God. These ideas, these promises, they, these dreams, you didn't come up with them on your own. And when you have hopes to see your life prosper and move forward the way that God promises, when, when we look at that, we, we need to start recognizing, wait a minute, I didn't come up with this on my own. I am not God. I am not the source of the promise. And that is what this story about the Shunammite woman is all about. This story points out the fact that she recognized, wait a minute, I didn't ask for a boy. This promise came from God. And what she decided to do is when she first saw the promise die in her life, is she said, you know what, I'm going to return this to sender. I'm going to take this right back to the man of God. I'm going to lay it at his feet. I'm going to put it right on his bed so he can't miss it. And I'm going to say, you know what, I, I didn't come up with this. This wasn't my idea. I can't fix it. Only God can fix this. I've got to return this right back to God. Say, God, would you please do something about this? That's where I think some of us in this room, we need to get a little more Shunammite woman in us. Some of us in this room are going through life a little discouraged because it looks like something, a dream that we had has died. And we just sit there and we go, oh, it's dead. All the while, there's an answer. 
All the while, there's an answer where we could come back and say, you know what, I'm going to bring this right back to the feet of Jesus. I'm going to bring this right back to God. And I'm going to just beg and say, God, can you please bring this dream back to life? Bring my marriage back to life. Bring my health back to life. Help me, God. There, I have so much hope here, and it was your idea. Help me, God. you got to understand, I'm not saying the blame here lies on God. That's not what I'm saying at all. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is that you and I need to understand the character of God is that he's waiting for you. He's there waiting for you to bring your hopes, your trauma, uh, your traumas, your, your discouragement, your dreams that have died. Bring them to him and, and say, God, could you do something about this? I want to ask you if you would to stand at your feet as we get ready to close here because I think I think how we're going to close here tonight is by looking at the very last thing that happens in this story. Because the very last thing that happens in this story is so significant, and it's the key of how you get out of the difficult circumstances you're in. It's the key of how when you're in a difficult circumstance, you don't get discouraged, and you don't drown, and you don't sink, and you don't let things just die around you. This is the key. In this story, and first off, every story in the Bible, Every parable, every character, every person in the Bible is a bright, glowing, neon sign that points us to the person of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament points out the fact that we need a Savior. The New Testament points out the fact that Jesus Christ is that Savior. And in the Old Testament, there has been six miraculous miraculous births before this. This is women who were infertile, and then they had a miracle and had a baby. Six times before, this is the seventh time that this story happens in scripture the the seventh time now what's so significant about the number seven i'm not trying to be mystical but every time the number seven comes up in scripture it represents perfection it represents beauty it it, it represents a completion and what this is doing is this story is pointing a picture a bright neon sign to the person of jesus in fact, every other miraculous birth in Scripture up to this point, the child had a name. This child is unnamed. Why? This story is pointing us to Jesus. So this story ends. It's such a significant thing that will change your life and will change mine. And I don't even know if Elisha understood the words he was about to speak. We're going to echo through eternity. When the woman came into the room, the thing that she, uh, she heard come out of Elisha's mouth is, Woman... Hold on to the son. Woman, pick up your son. Woman, grab a hold of your son. Woman, grab a hold of this promise. And guys, that's what you need to know is your key to getting out of your difficult time. Is when you find yourself there going, I feel like my promise is dead. You've got to grab onto the son. You've got to grab onto Jesus and say, God, I'm not letting go of you. And in the midst of these circumstances where I'm terrified, I'm scared, it doesn't look like things are coming together for me. I'm just going to hold on to you. And God, when, when I hold on to you, would you bring these dreams back to life? With no one looking around, bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here today and you say, I've got a sick heart. I've been so discouraged. I've, I've seen people around me and their lives are being blessed and it feels like mine's not. If that's you, just a confession of faith. No one looking around. Hold your hand up high in the air. That's so many of you. So many of you. This is what we're going to do. With your hands still high in the air, I want you to pray with me and let's, let's ask Jesus. Ask Jesus to resurrect those dreams. Right now, what I want to encourage every person in this room to do is to to ask God, is there a dream that I've given up on? Is there a promise I've given up on? Is there something I'm letting die next to me? And you just you just want me to bring it to you. God, as you reveal these things to us right now, I pray that you would help us hold on to your son, that we'd hold on to Jesus, and that in the midst of our discouragement right now, as we hold on to Jesus, I pray that you would bring us life, that you bring us belief, that you bring us hope, that you bring us a future, God where we've given up on things in our past, we bring it right back to you and we beg you, God, be our Savior. I pray right now for every person in this room with a sick heart, where we've dealt with unbelief, that you would come and touch us right now. You come be with us right now. Now with your own words, I just want to encourage you to, to speak these words out. It's a confession of faith. Say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, forgive me. 
Jesus, bring my dreams back to life. Bring my hopes back to life. God, I thank you that we can come before you. I thank you that you love us enough that you don't want us to just walk through discouragement on our own, but you want us to grab onto you, hold on to the sun, and then you, you bring things back to life. You give us hope. You give us future. And for every person in this room today, I pray that this would be a message that would rock our world, that as we leave here today, we would start recognizing, wait a minute, I just need to hold on to Jesus through this. Maybe he can fix this. It's not maybe, God. We believe you can help us. So be with us today. I pray you would encourage us today. Help us today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you believe our God's good, let's give him a shout of praise.